Happy Wednesday, everybody. Happy Wednesday. I wasn't playing chicken with you. The power is still on. It's a crazy storm. It has been a crazy storm for two days here, but I am here. I am just delayed because I had to go over and get a coffee. I was losing my mind. I knew I couldn't, I knew I couldn't hang in any longer. Good morning and happy Wednesday. I missed you yesterday. I am sorry. I just could not see myself um, driving through all these crazy country back roads to get to the studio because I didn't need to be here. I was working on the book yesterday and I thought, man, if I go up there and there's some kind of a tragedy, I'm just going to have myself to blame. But I missed seeing you and ha extra happy Wednesday. Now we're together again. Let's see who's here. It's lonely in here today. I'm the only one in here today. That's always a bit eerie. Let's see. Robin, hello in Wisconsin. Good to see you. Carol, great to see you too. Carol, I have to write to you. God help me remember. I want to talk to you about that Prady rug. Linda, good to see you in New Jersey. And Kirsten, good to see you. Thank you for your great Mickey Mouse message. I loved it. It sped up. Sometimes we leave each other um, voice messages and this one sped up and it was like, beep, 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 and I couldn't tell it. I couldn't hear any of it, but I listened to it a few times because it was so funny. Uh, it, it put a big smile on my face. Suze, hello in Kansas. Good to see you. Mm. Oh, boy, I am behind with coffee. Beverly, good to see you. Good morning. I am well, but let's see if our buddy um, Kira is on. Kira wrote a little while ago and said a tree came down in her yard in Plymouth, Mass., and hit both cars, right? Square over the driveway, right? And then she wrote a few minutes later to say she was propping up the tree um, so that they could like move the cars out. And I wrote back and said, don't prop up the tree, baby, don't do it. You can't prop trees up. And now I haven't heard from her, which makes me extra nervous. Let's see if she logs on that little devil, keeping me guessing. Northeast is drenched. Thankful. Okay. So it's, you know, it's so different from area to area because I'm not see, I saw a couple trees broken on the way in. So it is wildly windy. Um, I'm, you know, I'm not going to start, but it's so hard uh, to endure all of these and it's nobody's fault. It's just life. It's nobody's fault. But all of these forecasts of like huge, you know, worst hurricanes since 38 kind of stuff. And then nothing happens. And then on a day like today and yesterday, it's even it's much worse. It's many fold worse and not really not really so much warning, I guess. Who, who knows? Right. Who knows? We won't start with all that uh, surmising. Suze, it's rainy and chilly. Perfect day. You like that weather. You like that blustery weather. Lots of enduring too. So, oh, you have sunny and a slight chill. So many of our buddies here love to stay in, right? You don't need any excuse. The rain is a good excuse, but some of us don't need any excuse. It's just nice to be in. I used to love rainy days when I was a kid because I hated being hot. I hated, I'm not a sun person by any means. I'm not a beach person by any means. I don't mind being at the beach in the winter or in the evening, but I do not like to be there when the sun is blazing down. Now that I have kids, I'm forced to occasionally do it, but then I will 100% be swimming in the ocean because I just cannot, I just can't sit there and, and rot. I just can't. Give me a village with a cute cafe and some cute shops anytime. I am not a tropical person. But when I was a kid, it was the same. And it was like the nuns would have us outside in all weather, as you can imagine. They wouldn't be outside. They would be inside watching from the windows. But um, they would have us outside in all weather. And sometimes it was so hot and miserable. And I would just like long for a rainy day because if it was pouring rain, they would let us stay inside. And I and, and then you could do pictures or take out the boxes of crayons and stuff like that. And it was so much nicer than being out there sweating it out, you know. That stuff is so stressful when you're a kid, you know. Afraid you're going to be sweaty. Afraid you're going to start to stink. Who, know, who knows? Who knows? Kids don't need any reason to make fun of other kids. So it's just, I'm, I'm pretty sure that hasn't changed, sadly. Donna, good to see you in Alberta. I loved your message the other day on how you met your your other hooking buddy. I love I love messages like this. I don't I, I responded, but I don't always respond. And if I don't respond, um, give me a kick, give me a, like a little push because I love reading everything. Everything that gets sent to me, I read it. I read it. Sometimes I have help, and someone will write back to you on an order thing with RCH for ribbon candy hooking. But 
if I sign my name, you know that I read it and I wrote it and it's me who's talking to you. But I love getting these messages. People have been writing the most lovely messages about the kids and about our problems with the schools and uh, the resolution for the moment. And I appreciate every single one of them. And I wish that I had time to respond as sincerely as I feel every time I get a nice message like that. But sooner or later, I'm waiting for that time. You know, Teddy said to me last night, um, it, 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 it like made me cry. It was so it was so sad. He goes, remember, mom, when you used to not be so busy and we and you used to have tons of time. And I thought, oh, my God, that was so long ago. I don't really remember. I mean, it was pre homeschooling and all that and pre busy with, you know, the business. And now I'm at a point where I absolutely have to be getting some help with hiring some people and having formal formal employees in place and things like that. And I am so happy for that jump. But this weird interim in between, you know, this weird twilight has created a lot of um, stress. And I probably didn't handle things right or do things on time. The, the fact that that little guy remembers that I used to have endless time to sew um, plush toys, you know, out of video game characters that he made up and things like that. I do it once in a blue moon, but I used to do it all the time. And I have, I have got to find my way back there. We will see. Leveling up, as, as he says in the game world, is hard. Leveling up is hard, but it's a good thing. Catherine, good to see you. Nada, good to see you. And Carrie, good to see you. Uh, Carrie, I saw some of your comments or posts on the page. I'm always so happy when I look at that page. People helping people. Fantastic. Joy, good to see you. And Courtney, right side by side there, the sisters. Good to see you. Listening while you work. <laughs> Sound like that tune at all? Um, not so many buddies on today. I hope everybody is faring okay. That makes me that makes me nervous because we are hit pretty hard in this part of the country. And Kira in Massachusetts hit um, exceptionally hard. Unlucky tree coming down over both cars. I mean, that is one. You gotta you gotta feel like Murphy has a special eye on you when something like that happens, right? And she is not online. Mm. So busy busy times but and i know my mom is okay she's out with her girlfriends today they had a great thrifting day planned on guilford here which is a beautiful town on the water but they decided rightly so that even though the shops and things are open it wasn't such an atmospheric day in the middle of like a winnie the pooh heffalump type blustery storm to be out thrifting and looking at galleries on the green and things like that so another day will be better i think but um, it's good to see everybody there. You are all doing well, and you all have pow uh, power. So we'll say a little prayer for our buddies who are on who are on the East Coast having, having the storm. And I know the storm is on the move, too. We'll see how it goes. It's just like one of these um, slow burns, right? It's just two days of hammering rain, localized flooding. Yeah, right, Linda? I hope her car is all right, too. I know her husband's already at work, so that's a good sign. She, I think she probably is, too. Um, but I hope the cars are working. You know, that's quite a thing. I woke up to the sound. You know how I have that crazy vignette in my front lawn? I've described it. I've got about 200 of those plastic colorful pumpkins, most of them orange, but I do go for like the blues and the purples and all that too. About 200 of them in the front lawn and all kinds of configurations set up for Halloween. And I woke up, it was still dark, so it was like five or six to the sound of plastic balls rolling across the street. And it was one of those subconscious things where I was working it into a dream about waitressing. This is a common one where my table is yelling at me because they haven't gotten their food yet. And I reach in my apron pocket and I realize I forgot to put the order in. And meanwhile, I hear the stuff rolling and I think it's in the kitchen of the dream, right? But begging them to get the food out fast. And then I woke up and realized it was my pumpkins that had like fallen off the tree, fallen off their sticks and were rolling across the street. We live on quite a busy street and uh, cars starting to hit them. <laughs> It's not funny. Cars starting to hit them and drag them. Real distinctive sound, dragging plastic up a street. You know what I mean? Pavement and plastic. Not a good way to start the day. That's why I needed a coffee. So anyway, good to see you. And you know what? I dug through the bookshelf last night because I wanted to find another book that would hit, hit the spot. Uh, for happiness and for inspiration today. I will run a show, obviously today and tomorrow, to make up for the lost one yesterday. And this is the book I have in my hand. Now, you know that the, um, you know that the, I'm not alone anymore, I got nervous. Hey, Steph. You know that the new hooking, Hook Drugs Landscape is coming out, right, that book. So if you're part of the Rug Hooking Magazine book club, that's probably on the way to you, and I know it's on the way to me. But I found this one on the bookshelf, and this is a little bit older. I think this is, what was this, 2006, 2009. Um, 
<laughs> West Nada says West Coast atm atmospheric river was last week for five days. Wind and 13 inches of rain. Extraordinary, isn't it? Extraordinary. Makes me want to look into the history of the Farmer's Almanac. By the way, I reposted something from the Farmer's Almanac. I'm not a big Facebook poster. Causes lots of trouble, doesn't it? But I saw that today was officially Black Cat Appreciation Day, which makes sense the week of Halloween. So I reposted that in our Facebook group, which is Rogue Hooking and Punch Needle Club. And I invited everybody. I'm actually begging everybody to post pictures of your black cat rugs. And I have a very good reason for it. I can't tell you right now, but I have a very good reason. I would love to see your black cat rugs. Kira, black cat drawings also. Kira, Kirsten, I did it. Carrie, I can always rely on your page for good info. Good, Carrie. I hope so. I hope so. I never see people blathering on that page, you know. Um, rarely. Rarely do I see people blathering. But uh, when I do, we remove it or remove the comment if it's a bit abrupt or misleading. Not on purpose, of course. Just Some people are so rigid in the way that they work and um, don't leave any room for the possibility that other people, number one, could work in another way with different tools, or number two, want to work in another way with different tools. So we always wanna leave that door and window wide open for all different ways that people work. And in honoring the different ways that people work, we learn so much about technique and possibilities, right? So today, if you wanna shut the door, you can, if you guys wanna talk. Um, today I have this book out and it turned out to be a great book. Now, you know, I have to admit this has been on my shelf for a long time. So this is not the one that just came out. This is one that came out in 2009 by Anne Marie Littenberg. And, you know, I have to admit, I haven't gone through this book in great detail because I'm not a huge one for landscapes. I'm not a huge one personally for realism and, um, landscapes. So when I took this book out, I was so heartily and happily surprised at how much inspiration and good information is in here. And it turns out that so many of these rugs in here, including the one I used for my thumbnail today, are my new favorite rug. Dave, good to see you. Another gray day in the city. I know. Is it really bad in Toronto too? You're getting stormy and all that? It is so bad here. It is so... And you know the worst part? I'm stopping and I'm doing content. The worst part for me is that it was finally these beautiful autumn days tunnel driving under these canopies of colorful trees and you know the wind for these two days is just knocking them all off so it's still crunchy crispy walking through piles of leaves times but we really accelerated that with the storm and it's sad to lose these beautiful leaves when they were finally at their peak it is what it is so I found out that I really do like landscapes and you know when you think about it and I did think about it because I was thinking about how to approach this, um, this episode. When you think about it, what is a landscape? It's basically the entire world outside of your door, right? I mean, how do you define a landscape? Everything that's outside your door is, is part of the landscape, isn't it? It includes other buildings, other people, um, but outside. And, you know, it made me think about studying literature years ago in college and stuff and thinking about uh, Greek plays and how, sideline, but I think interesting, how, at least in Greek plays, um, a woman was always represented, and let's, we're not even going to discuss this because it'll get us all upset, but a woman was always uh, represented in, in Greek, uh, by Greek playwrights, right, ancient Greek, as being suspicious and interior, meaning always inside the home. So that, may, that meant that the woman's place was in the home, right, uh, which we expect from this sort of period of history. And, you know, but beyond that, always being inside the house had suspicious overtones to it, didn't it? So that whole world, right, through history for hundreds of years, that whole interior world was the woman's world while a man was typically out working and typically doing something physical and maybe doing something financial as time went on, but very different worlds, very different separate worlds. And I think interior and exterior through art, through the many centuries um, of art has been represented in very different ways, right? Because when you think of an interior, you th I typically think um, female, right? I think of a kitchen. I think of ho hooked rugs that I particularly love that are like kitchen pieces, little vignettes, still lifes, things like that. When I think of a uh, hooked rug of an inside, when I think of the vast outside, there are many more possibilities, right? Which made me think future episode idea, 
looking at rugs that are set as interior design, right? Not landscapes, not outdoor, interior. And how to bring back the idea of the cozy interior um, in a way that it pops the same way landscapes do, right? Vastness and distances, and as far as the eye can see, all that majestic grandness of the outdoors um, is one thing, but also the quaintness and the coziness of indoors is another thing. It just made me realize how different those two places are. That's a future thought, and I'm, I'm excited about pursuing that thought. But today, let's talk about outside. We are looking at landscapes of outside, and this can include so many things, right? So let's take a look at some of them. Now, don't want to spill this precious coffee. There we go. That looks all right. So I want to start with this cover design. This has to be one of Anne Marie's own, right? I didn't even check to see the uh, attribution to the cover design from the editor, from the publisher. We'll have to check back. It's not immediately obvious. I wish I would have thought of that. I am assuming it's one of her designs because why not put your own work on the cover of the book, right? We'll see. We'll figure it out. But the cover design is extraordinary. A beautiful autumn scene. Speaking of autumn trees, you mean besides the fireplace hearth? Yes. Yes. Oh, let me catch up. Sonia, good to see you waiting for big storms here in Francisville, Louisiana. Okay, fingers crossed. You have had enough fun this season, right? My word. Catherine, you mean besides the fireplace hearth? Yeah, I do. Well, I love that fireplace hearth image, too. I love that universal one. Um, but it does make me think you rarely see a hook rug that's set indoors, right? That's not like an Aunt Lydia or like fireplace hearth, one of those. But it's, it's they're harder to find, aren't they? And what does that say about... Um, like our interest in where our home is where the heart is. My heart is always inside. It do does make me it does make me question all my sort of compositions and all my starting points when I think of interior versus exterior and just the definition of a landscape. But let's see, there's lots of variety in here. Now, we've got this nice autumn scene on the cover, which I love and sadly is now on the pavement. But look at this water. This is the first thing that really drew me in. Isn't it great? Great directional hooking, right? That great horizontal ho hooking is creating a scene of such stillness. And just that very light reflection of the trees in the water, at first it looks like it's just a color-changing wool, doesn't it, that's been hooked very carefully horizontally, but it's actually not. The colors in the wool are reflecting the trees above them, and it gives you such a sense of peace because if the water is that still that you're getting that kind of mirror reflection, it's very peaceful and quiet. Nothing like today. Very peaceful. Um, so I think that's a beautiful start. I wanted to look at some of her main points. I have just scratched the surface of this tremendous book, and I highly recommend it. Highly recommend it. I never thought I would be so engrossed in a book on landscapes, but it really isn't a book on landscapes. It's a book on hook drugs. And she's putting forward such fantastic composition, inspiration, such great ideas that can be applied to anything. But my idea of what a landscape in ha is has changed since last night when I started looking at this book. So she starts at the introduction talking about why we hook rugs and how some people do it for a hobby, some people do it to stay busy. I've heard a lot of people say to stay sharp, right, because they've heard um, you know, doctors say the more new things you learn that connect your head to your hand, the better you are long run with keeping your wits about you and all that. A lot of people enter a hobby like this for that reason. A lot of people are just very inspired, self-expression, love textiles, love tactile work, so many different reasons. But in this introduction, she shows this remarkable rug by Ray Harrell. And I'm sure Ray Harrell was the author of that book, Barely Hooked, that we covered with all of the nudes. Do you remember that episode? I'm pretty sure that was Ray Harrell, H-A-R-R-E-L and R-A-E. But this piece is by Ray Harrell. I'm going to show it to you. Heinsberg, Vermont. Beautiful, beautiful piece. Um, it, I immediately fell in love with this. Now, that's what I call a landscape. Let me bring it into focus a bit better. There we go. Isn't that glorious? Now, part of the gloriousness, I think, is the irregular border, which is so interesting. The softness, the roundness, it gives you the feeling of a world. It's very spherical. Look at the way she brings the tree trunks in here, right? The movement of the tree trunks brings it into stripies, a little bit of a Van Gogh sky, that oversized sunset or sunrise. Absolutely beautiful. 
I love the way that the buildings are handled in, in a very sort of bare, simplistic way in contrast to the trees and in contrast to the sky. It looks like wind or water over here. It's just got so much good going on. And the color palette is absolutely fantastic. It's an autumn color palette, but I'm not getting the sense it's necessarily an autumn scene. It is just, yep, Linda, brilliant. Perfect word for that. Absolutely fantastic. Um, so yeah, so that was the first one that really lured me in. Now she goes on to say, to talk about what is what is a landscape. Now this is where I started thinking about Greek drama, right, which hardly ever happens anymore. A landscape represents an artist's perception of the world out of doors. Elements in nature are depicted how the artist chooses to see them. Now this is the thing, isn't it? Just like a photographer frames a scene, you are framing a scene, but you have much more wiggle room being a textile artist and a photographer, right? Unless you do a lot of doctoring of your photographs after the fact. You have limitless possibilities on how you're going to frame. A landscape, a landscape may be created from a wide variety of subjects and myriad of media. Cave paintings in France dating back 30,000 years show the drama of the hunt. Now that's true. That's a great outdoor landscape scene. Life, death, um, you know, man, nature, animals, all of these uh, elements, uh, you know, at, I don't want to say at war, but battling against each other. High drama. Interesting, isn't it? Interesting. Of course, that's the kind of thing we see in those cave paintings. And medieval tapestries woven in the finest wool and silk illustrate a warrior's, uh, a warrior ruler's travels through the countryside. You can really picture that, can't you? When you picture medieval tapestries, not just like the uh, Bayou Tapestry or the Unicorn Tapestry, but lots of tapestries on even American home walls, right? Because we, we brought them in during the Gilded Age from faraway places. Huge, epic scenes of storytelling, often about a hero in a landscape. Never indoors, so. That's one thing. That's one thing I can't stop thinking about. It just made me think of Vermeer and how his paintings were indoors, right? The black and white checkered floors, girl with a pearl earring. Um, but rarely, rarely do you see that, do you? Particularly earlier on, the world was outdoors. Indoors was just shelter. That was it. It, was, it served a skeletal purpose in lives. Lush flora may be depicted with breathtaking accuracy. I want to pause to show you the illustration she's got here. It's called Camel Shump, uh, Burlington, Vermont. This is by the author Anne-Marie Littenberg. Absolutely beautiful. Uh, various plied threads on linen, silk, cotton, polyester, wool, etc. on rug war. So this is one of hers. How gorgeous is that? How gorgeous. Look at the swirling skies. Look at the shelves of color in the distance. All shades of blue. Look at the autumn leaves in a pile on the ground. Those look like birch trees catching the light. And the off colors, that sort of that, that burnt, rusty leaf color and that very, very sagey in-between green color. It is not summer, it is not spring. It is headed toward winter and the swirls in the sky, absolutely brilliant. Isn't that gorgeous? Reminds me a little bit of like Alphonse Mucha, right, his art, a little bit of the, the lining going on. It's a mix, the trees are very realistic, but in the distance there are some lines to define. Reminds me more of Mucha, but just the movement, the colors, that fantastic composition. Look at all those horizontals against all of those verticals. It's like it's like a grid, isn't it? it? But your eye doesn't read it that way. It just, your eye says, that's a good composition and leaves it there. But that's why the composition is so good. It's brilliant. So she goes on in this chapter to talk about um, choices. You know, choices you make in what you choose and how you choose to frame it. She talks about inspiration in selecting a subject. And she uses a great example. This is going to be, this, this piece I'm going to show you is called Let's Play in the Moonlight. And it is, a, again, by the author, designed and hooked by Anne-Marie Littenberg, Burlington, Vermont, 2005. And I'm going to read you what she wrote about it and then show it to you so you'll appreciate it even more. She says, I am drawn to spare, transcendent beauty of vast spaces. I find peace in watching the sunset or in seeing a moonlight glint, seeing moonlight glint over water. I love to hook rugs where the viewer's eye is drawn to the drama of light. I try to create scenes that evoke feelings. My subject may be of secondary importance to the mood or atmosphere created by the design. 
Let's Play in the Moonlight was inspired by a walk on a rocky shore of Lake Champlain, love Lake Champlain, with the Adirondack Mountains glowing in the distance. It is, is this rug about the sky and the water the rela- or the relationship between the person and the dog playing on the beach or romantic ideals about night or full moon? Now, I love what she wrote there because it, let me make sure we're in focus get my hands out of the way too so you see here there's a figure of a woman on the beach with the dog let's play in the moonlight all of these three things that she puts to us that she poses as possible ideas is it about the landscape is it about the vastness is it about the view is it about the mystery the romance the moon the night sky or is it about the very small story of the woman playing with the dog I mean it doesn't matter does it but some a piece like this that, that brings you to so many different questions is a good piece. It really makes you think and it makes you look. Isn't that gorgeous? She's good. Oh, she's so good. I'm never going to be good like that. That is good, good. So, and then she shows some other. Now, here's another one by Ray Harrell. I don't know if we saw this one when we looked at that barely hooked book. Um... Let's look at it. This is the apple. I know what, I know there were some biblical, because it was a book on nudes, I know there were some biblical rugs in there, and I know because, remember, the video got um, earmarked as being, like, naughty, like, you know, because I had shown, um, I think Michelle McRelly's thing is the thumbnail, and there were bare shoulders and maybe more bare bits and bobs. But um, I thought that was outrageous that they would pull that. But anyway, we got in trouble and I had to change the thumbnail. But I don't think that this one was in there. I don't recognize this anyway. The apple, uh, number eight cut, over dyed, as is wool on monk's cloth. So this is a landscape that represents the Garden of Eden and the setting is the, is the Old Testament story. So this is another beautiful, different kind of landscape. Now, I guess, shame on me, when I've always thought about landscapes, I think of like a photographer's view. And I think about just the vast landscapes. But all of the ones I'm showing you today, including Let's Play in the Moonlight, they're storytelling pieces. And I love a good story. So, you know, again, I have had to sort of recalibrate and rethink what my idea was about what a landscape is, because these are all landscapes. These are all set outside in, in, a, in a setting, right? So they are, by definition, landscapes. This one is, I think, remarkably cool. I like the swirls again, the swirly sky. Same ideas, same sort of motifs as she did before, but new story, beautiful sun behind them. It's such a beautiful piece. It really has shades of Botticelli, doesn't it? The Eve has real shades of Botticelli. And I think this is God up in the heavens, right? Not, not overly happy not feeling overly happy at the way things are transpiring here. But um, one of the things I especially love about this piece is the shading of that kind of fern they're standing on. I mean, have you ever thought to hook something with this, picking out lines and colors this way? You've got that very Jacobian stylized fern, but then for each kind of frond that's coming off the center stem, a different color of green. And man, you would think that that would be confusing and distracting, but it is not. It is the prestige of this piece, I think. I mean, that's my favorite part. I love the entire piece, of course. But that is remarkably smart, the way that she worked that. And I like this, too. This is the State House in Vermont. I was just there two weekends ago, right, in uh, Montpelier. Absolutely beautiful. I love, um, I love rugs of buildings, you know, marking a building that way. There's one up on auction now. I think it's somewhere in Wisconsin, the auction house. But it's, um, gosh, whose house was it? I want to say Ma- maybe Madison, one of, the, one of the president's houses. I can't remember. It's a very damaged rug, but it's really beautiful. I love it when a home or a building is immortalized this way in rug hooking because um, it's, it, you know, it's something that you can always come back to and say, Oh, there's that, right? There's that building. I know that building. And when you see buildings hooked that you don't know what they are, it's very mysterious. When you see a farmhouse, um, like I once found one on Cape Cod and I should have bought it. I just didn't have the money at the time at all. And um, I so wish I had because it just said, you know, it was from New Hampshire. And I thought I could be driving around for weeks, months, years around New Hampshire side streets looking for this building that might not be there anymore. But the fact that it was immortalized at that at that one time when the rug was hooked was so magical to me. I'll never forget that rug. That is, that is the one that got away. Helene, good to see you. Happy Wednesday. So, you know, this rug, um, this book is just 
is just extraordinary. I want to show you a couple more. I know we're running over as usual. You know, this, this next thing that she mentions, I think, is the key. Don't be hampered by reality, right? Let me take one little sip because I'm still kind of edgy. Don't be hampered by reality. She says, if you are trying to depict a particular view that actually exists, think carefully, this is gold, think carefully about what real elements you want to include in your composition. That's the crux of it. I mean, she said that better than I could have ever said that. That is the crux of it. If you're drawn to a street scene, to, do you include the parking meters and the trash barrels that line the sidewalk? As you gaze at the distant mountains, do you want to include the utility poles uh, that cut a swath through the view? These are very good questions. And I don't think these are necessarily questions about ugly versus pretty things. I think these are questions about you need to crystallize your composition. Now, if you are looking at a village scene, and there's, there's going to be many buildings, many elements. Maybe there's people outside. There's going to be lots of different kinds of trees. There's going to be pretty things, ugly things. There's going to be a, a distant perspective as well. There's going to be a sky. There's going to be a landline. I mean, there's going to be a lot of things to consider. And I think she makes that perfect point of choose the things that you want the most, like put them into your little crucible, burn it down, and say to yourself, these are the things, what I'm left with are the things I want the most in the composition. Because when you anchor your piece with those, with those element pieces that you chose, and you just let the other ones go, and let them go, then you know you're going to end up with a composition that's even stronger because you're highlighting and emphasizing the parts that you like the best, that you consider to be the most important pieces for that composition. It doesn't have to be what is literally there at all. Right? And that's where interpretation and inspiration comes in. You have to remind yourself about breaking rules. Right, You aren't a photograph. that You aren't a camera, thank goodness. And you do have the ability to make decisions about what parts of the composition you want. It's not incomplete if all of the parts aren't there. It's your view of it. It's your vision of it. It's your, your spin on it. Oh, thank you, Helene. And, you know, she gives us a great example of this. This example is by Molly Dye, D-Y-E, uh, from Vermont, Jacksonville, Vermont. Does anybody know? I know there was an article um, in Rug Hooking Magazine. Does anybody know anything about Molly Dye? I would love to know because I am just in love with all of her pieces. And there is, like, nothing online about her. If you know anything, please let me know. I would love to, I would love to chase and stalk a little bit in the nicest way. So she shows us an example of what she's talking about with this Molly Dye piece. It's called The Dales. I'm going to show it to you first. Made of novelty fabrics, yarns, and ribbon on linen, uh, nine, uh, 2005. So this is about as far from a traditional. Carry that fern does create good good balance and keeps your eye moving through the piece. Absolutely, that's the job the composition does for you. Having a strong composition means that your eye is going to be traveling in one of the ways that it expects to, but staying in the picture a little bit longer, right? You don't want it to just exit. That's the thing. Now, this is this Molly Dye piece called the Dales. Now, this is meant to represent the Yorkshire Dales. And if you've ever been to York or any of the towns in the county of Yorkshire in England, this probably doesn't look like that, right? But she put the elements that she wanted to put, I'm over here on this page, that she wanted to put um, into this composition. And she let the other ones go. And as a result, we have got a whimsical, colorful, true piece of art. True piece of art. This reminds me a bit of like a 1950s, 1960s. You know these mid-century paintings with the strong horizontal... Um, um, uh, what do you want to call it, movement to them, you know? There's so many of those. It was, such a, it was such a style for like five years. And unfortunately, the people who did it most were people who painted in the style of, and I'm not being negative, but Bob Ross, people who worked for, not Bob Ross, but people who worked for galleries and would be expected to put out X amount of paintings in like one summer for tourists, um, often worked in the style where, you know, have you ever seen this? It's mostly the same colors too, like, um, warm colors, working very horizontally with them. I love those paintings, but they never quite hit the mark because you rarely see one that's truly good, unlike this Molly Dye piece, which is truly, I just love it, I just love it so much. So the author says, 
She's talking about clarity in your artistic interpretation does not mean that the landscape you create must be realistic. That's not clarity. Clarity means that you've made a conscious and thoughtful decision about what to keep and what to throw out. What's important, what's superfluous to what you're thinking, to your composition, right? Because if you have everything in there, it, it kind of follows at that point. You better be working in a very realistic style because if the things are not handled realistically and successfully, it's going to be very hard to interpret what every little thing is. It's better to make choices, right, and to let go of some of it. And she says, your fresh perspective is what makes you an artist. Molly Dye designed and hooked the Dales based on her interpretation of the Yorkshire Dales of Northern England. Would I know that this rug depicts Yorkshire without the title giving me a clue? Does it matter? To me, it does not. And the artistic integrity of the piece easily stand, stands on its own. And that's what makes it, I think, even more interesting. Does it matter is the key, right? I love that she wrote that because it doesn't matter at all. It has such an illustrative quality and it has such an energy about it. And once you know what it is, I've been to Yorkshire many times. I love that part of England. It's even more special because I'm trying to see it the way that she saw it, I'm trying to pick out these buildings and figure out what kinds of buildings they are. It has more of an Eastern European look to me. So it makes it interesting to find out that I'm wrong, right? I love it when that happens. Not always, but sometimes. Let's look at one or two more and then I'm going to break and get some work done. Oh, uh-oh. Now this is really nice too. Another Molly dye. Um, and what she's saying here, she's saying, as a hooked rug fiber artist, you can experiment by exaggerating, you, exaggerating the proportion and scale of your grand elements in the landscape. Now this holds true of all folk art, doesn't it? Once you start to mess around with scale, uh, perspective, proportions, you are immediately in the squarely in the realm of folk art as you should be right um, and as you are welcome to be certainly as a rug maker plying what is considered a true folk art so she says I once hooked a landscape this this is interesting don't you love to hear how people kind of fell off the horse and got back on again because it it humanizes people um, like Anne Marie, Anne Marie who wrote this book and do this kind of work it humanizes them um, she says, I once hooked a landscape with what I thought were bales of hay. My husband thought they were sunflowers. I didn't want my bales of hay to be abstract interpretations, so I rehooked them three times without success. I eventually gave up and tore them out entirely. Now, she ended the paragraph there, so I'm just kind of thinking the moral to that story is for her, you know, she got to a point where the frustration kind of out uh, rode the pleasure of having that element in the composition. And sometimes you just have to make that choice, don't you? Um, everybody everybody does this. You, your, the great vision that you have, you're playing it out, and it doesn't shake out the way you thought, and it becomes frustrating. That's when you need to regroup and think, are the bales of hay uh, really necessary to the composition, or can I just let them go? Will I be more pleased with the end result if I just let them go, right? And it's hard to let things go. It's hard hard to because it's like you're compromising what the initial vision was and you're in love with the initial vi vi vision and it's hard but sometimes it does have to happen um, if you can't make it work it it's up to each person each time whether you're going to stick with the abstract thought or with the reality of what you're actually making and, and what it looks like so this is the piece this is one of my favorite pieces of today the devil's workshop Designed and hooked by Molly Dye, Jacksonville, Vermont, 1998. Um, Molly is Molly is uh, Molly is facile with traditional and non-traditional techniques and materials. Facile. I know facile means French in French, easy, but I don't know what it means in English. That's awful, isn't it? I must be a ding dong. Help me out with the definition of the word facile. Um, Molly is facile with traditional and non-traditional techniques and materials. Uh, maybe easy, maybe it is like easy, maybe just like proficient. She works easily with them. She finds them easy. Never, I've never heard that word before. I'm sorry. Uh, but this is the piece that I am just absolutely lusting after at this moment. And I think part of it is, again, this vertical. She does a lot with this vertical kind of um, directional downspray, this really, really colorful directional hooking. I love the skeletal trees. I know the monitor's playing games right now. I love the skeletal trees in the background. I love the shift of color. I love the really over stylized over here, way over here. 
orange trees, right? Super stylized, kind of in an Art Deco style. I love the, sh the shift, the slope, the shape of the house. Proficient. Okay, thank you, Catherine. It, that's the, in context, that sounds right. Never heard that word before. Isn't that crazy? I'm a big girl. And I love the color changes in the ground here. Isn't that something? A bit of the Van Gogh, right? And then very unlike Van Gogh, this, this beautiful pink in the background, this beautiful pink field. It, do, it break, brings up questions about season, right? About vegetation. It, it, it's showing me shapes. And I, my eye is interpreting them. Um, based on how I feel about the piece and I feel very strongly about the piece because I happen to love these colors and I like the mystery of the shapes. I like how she even outlined these big round parts of the tree in the gray. I love the choices that she made. It's so expressionist. It's so different. She is expressing herself. She's expressing the way she sees this landscape. I mean, when I opened this book on landscapes, I was not easy to achieve, effortless. Okay, thank you. So, yeah. Kind of, kind of borrowing from the French. I'm going to start using the word facile. I don't even know if that's how you're supposed to say it in English. But it, it seems to mean a lot of good things. It's going to be a, a nice little placeholder. Be showing, I'd be showing off if I do because I didn't really know what it meant. But, you know, when I opened this book of landscapes, I did not expect to find uh, things that looked like that. I'll show you this one, too, because it's right here. Chapter 3, she talked, and then I'm going to end. Chapter 3, she talks about... Um, the, the sort of formal parts of composition, like she starts with balance. And she says a great thing. This piece that I just showed you by accident is called Wisteria, and it is hooked, designed and hooked by Betty Bouchard of uh, Richmond, Vermont, 1998. It's another beauty. And it's a good one to be showing when you talk about balance. Because she's about to talk about, I'm going to paraphrase, she's about to talk about how, you know, without formal training and speaking in too formal a language, we don't always know when we are seeing balance, right? You don't have to take an art class in, in composition to understand balance because your eye knows when something is balanced, it's pleasing. When something is not balanced, um, it can be uncomfortable, right? This is beautifully balanced. It doesn't mean that every piece needs to be balanced every time, does it? It just means when you see something like this, whether you are an art scholar or not, you're seeing the, the sort of chemistry between the fence and the trees. And to keep it interesting, you've got like bookends, two bits of land or tree here, and a little house in the middle, which is almost like a little postcard afterthought. And to make it even more interesting, there's kind of sidewalk lines going out at an angle at an unexpected angle, keeping you right there, rooted to the sidewalk, looking over the fence at this view. And then I think it really helps having the directional horizontal hooking on the horizon in the distance. It's just bringing your eye right in. You're looking for the safety of these straight lines when you've got this kind of real organic tangle here. And this is mimicking the tangle, but it's much more symmetrical. So you've got contrasts and balance happening. That's a great piece. That's a smart piece. It doesn't look like a huge piece. 15 by 16, number three and number four cut. Absolutely beautiful. So maybe we'll return to this book tomorrow because there's so much more to see. I didn't get to, I didn't get to the thumbnail. I'll show you a different, I'll show you it tomorrow. Um, and I'll show you, I'll put a different thumbnail tomorrow too. I'll show you a bunch more that you're just gonna, um, just gonna swoon over, I think. It's, I haven't even got to the back of the book yet. And there's an exclusive pattern in the back, too, that we'll look at together that I haven't taken out. This book is really remarkable. Let's spend some more time on it. So we'll come back here tomorrow to Hooked Rug Landscapes by Anne-Marie Littenberg. And this is put out by Rug Hooking Press. Oh, oh, look at her. I didn't look at the back yet either. What a pretty, what a pretty lady and talented, cheerful looking. This is the one I used for the thumbnail. I didn't realize it was right on the back cover. Uh, when I looked at that, I thought, oh, that's my new favorite rug of all time. But, um, and it might be, there's just so many in this book that are my new favorite rug of all time. They're all gorgeous. But the thing is, I think it's going to help us looking at these different landscapes. I think it's going to help us define what a landscape is. And if you also had a kind of weird preconceived idea that you expected landscapes to all be these vast views with uh, uh, very realistic trees, uh, and grass and distant views and perspective in place and um, 
it turns out we're wrong because many of the ones that are in this book are very folk art, very stylized, very different. And the fact that Anne Marie is really telling us you need to frame your piece, you need to think about composition and frame your piece, and telling us the first thing you need to think of what to leave out is that she's steering us more toward um, a very synthesized composition that is made up of conscious choices, deliberate choices. Being deliberate, I think, is the point of all this, right? So it's an interesting book, and it's filled with interesting ideas. I'm very happy that that's the one I grabbed. Nancy, good to see you. Hello from LV Nova Scotia. L LV Nova Scotia, come on, help me out. Gosh, come on. I'm, I'm very happy that you're here too. And we will certainly continue this conversation tomorrow. This book is does not bear rushing through, I don't think. So I will be back with you Thursday, which isn't one of our usual days. I'll be with you for coffee time tomorrow at noon Eastern Standard Time. And then remember on Friday, we're going to be doing our cocktail time, which is 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And we're going to be looking at that great book, um, Hooking on the Hill. So that'll be nice, right? We got a couple things to look forward to before the week is up. Las Vegas, Nevada. Why did I think it was NV Nova Scotia? That wouldn't be a V, would it? What is wrong with me today? I had tea instead of coffee this morning, right? That's what's wrong with me, and I haven't gotten this down my throat yet. What a ding dong. You're all good. You're all on your game. You're doing better than I am. I think I better um, drink this coffee, drain it quickly, get to work, recalibrate. I am not doing good. It was great seeing everybody, and I'm really looking forward to concluding this tomorrow. It'll probably be a bit of a long episode, but we will have fun devouring the pictures in this book. Take care, Nancy.